we can manage finances and we can be what I call tax ready and finance ready year round. And that's why I went ahead and created this course for you. So I can share that you can do this year round for your business or for the small business clients that you serve. So talking about small business clients or small business owners, let's go ahead and meet one. And this is Maria Hope. Her business is Her Biz Master VA LLC, and she's a master virtual assistant and an organizer extraordinaire. She loves to plan, organize, and she really just likes to get everybody's business in order. But what about her business? So she's decided to sit down after sitting with her business coach and she said, you know what? I'm going to write down my goals. Just like I write down the goals for my clients, I'm going to write down my goals. And my goal is to get my finances and taxes in order so I can have financial visibility and I can manage this year round. So she is super excited about that. So she went ahead and started her financial literacy journey because she understands that she needs to have some basic financial literacy skills for her to be able to move forward with her finances and her taxes. And so let's go ahead and take a look at that. So here are the seven key elements to manage business finances year round. You first need to track all of the money in and all of the money out that comes into the business year round. You then need to document all of these transactions and you need to store this information in a secure place so that way you always have access to this information when you need it. Then you need to look at both the transactions and all the documentation you have and really start learning what are the numbers and information that matters because what you're going to need to do is you're gonna to have to turn and transform that data into dollars. Now, what is the best way to do that? By learning how to leverage technology to understand and manage your finances smarter and faster, and that is one of the goals of what you are doing today. After that, you wanna go even deeper into financial literacy, and now you have to start learning the key accounting tasks related to managing your finances, but most importantly, you wanna go ahead and measure that financial performance so you can continuously grow your profits and your net worth and also stay compliant year round. Then reporting is always something you wanna keep in mind of because as you're managing your finances, there's going to be compliance that you need to do in regards to quarterly reports and annual forms. And you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have all of your information in real time, so that way you are always ready to go ahead and populate those reports. And last but not least, many of those reports not only are for you to be able to verify and validate your information, but they're also going to be sent to an agency. So you need to always be ready to file and pay any compliance related to your numbers. And those are the seven key learnings to manage your finances year round. So before we go any further, we really have to understand and we really need to be on the same page that all tracking really is, it's just bookkeeping. And so when we talk about bookkeeping or when we use accounting or when we use some other type of you know, financial literacy language, it's all essentially the same thing. I need to track my transactions in some kind of bookkeeping system. Again, if you've been in business long enough, um, as I have been, and especially since I worked with my mom um, in the restaurants, her books were literally books, like ledgers, big ledgers that we would have to write down, the money in, the money out. So we were able to really see and have a financial visibility on, okay, well, are we going to have enough money to pay payroll? Are we going to have enough money to go uh, back and get some more meat or get some more supplies for the business? And so we needed that financial visibility. And so the tracking was incredibly critical to be able to make more confident decisions in the business. Also, when you start tracking or bookkeeping for that matter, when you start the bookkeeping for a business, you also start saying, hey, okay, well, now that I'm tracking everything, I want to try to have the highest tax savings possible. So then what you start doing is you start combining your bookkeeping 
with your tax strategies. And so you start thinking, okay, well then if I am going to have to spend on my business to, to build my business and to grow my business, it makes perfect sense that I'm going to be spending on qualified expenses, which hopefully will eventually be tax deductible. Now, where is all this stuff going to be stored? That's the other big question. The tracking is also a bookkeeping system. And so what is that bookkeeping system? Where is everything going to be tracked and saved? And that's what I like to call the source of truth. So where are you going to save everything so you actually can sleep at night and know that if something happens or if an organization knocks on your door, you're going to be ready for that. Another reason that you want to track your expenses is because, again, you really want to focus on what's considered ordinary and necessary for your line of business. So that way you can be able to qualify for the Internal Revenue Code, which requires for your business expenses to be ordinary and necessary for you to possibly deduct them. So what is ordinary and necessary? That's really important. Well, interesting enough, it's a very simple definition. Ordinary is one that is common and accepted in your trader business. Necessary is one that is helpful and appropriate for your trader business. So if you look at that, that actually gives you a very open-ended opportunity for you to use necessary expenses and ordinary expenses for your industry, for your line of business, for your business profile, for you to grow and thrive as an entrepreneur. IRS, Internal Revenue Code, is just telling you that it needs to be ordinary and necessary for your business. But that is a great opportunity for you to really research what makes sense for your type of business. Okay, so now that you understand the importance that tracking is just really bookkeeping and that if you are doing all this work to track all of this information, that you should be thinking about what's considered qualified business deduction so that way you can possibly use that to be more strategic with your taxes and with your planning. So now let's take those concepts into tracking the money in and also tracking your money out. So let's cover tracking money in because there are so many types of monies that can come into your business. So let's look at this from the perspective of first keeping track of your gross income. So what is gross income? Gross income is non-employee compensation for services rendered, including payments received in cash, check, cash app, or credit cards. Now, why do I say non-employee compensation for services rendered? The reason why I'm very specific is because that self-employed individual, most commonly when they first started, they're contractors. And when they're contractors, unfortunately, they're in, a, they're in a very tricky situation because if they don't have any of this information, if they have no financial literacy education or background, they don't know what it means to be a contractor versus an employee. And so many times when they start working with, let's say, two, three, four different clients, Let's say truckers would be a perfect example of that, or Uber drivers or Lyft drivers. So they start working for Uber, or they start getting paid through Upwork, or they are working as a trucker for four big companies. They think that those big companies are their employers, and absolutely they are not their employees if they're getting paid gross income. They would only be their employees if they were actually on payroll. So what is it that they are receiving? They may be receiving a 1099 miscellaneous. They may be receiving a 1099K. They will be receiving gross sales from a client if they're working directly from a client and they invoice that client, right? They may be receiving commissions. So we're thinking about those real estate agents or those sales agents that get a commission check at the end of the month and it's a gross check those individuals that receive cash payments are getting paid in cash maybe through the cash app or tips um that's all gross income if you sell something sell something and have a gain on it that's also gross income and bartering so if you go and you barter with your fellow service provider that's also considered income okay so where else can you obtain income for your business now these are areas that you all should be aware of because whether or not you're waiting for a form. So again, you may not be receiving that 1099 miscellaneous. You may not be receiving that 1099K, but you know where all your money's at. 
your money's on your bank statement. The money is clearly going into your bank account and should be clearly seen through your deposits. Also, many times you may be using a point of sale system. So for instance, many of my uh, clients that were in the um, wellness or the health and wellness community, my barber shops, my uh, beauty beauticians, they would use a point of sale. And so they would actually see those gross sales on those summary reports. And that was really important because they would be able to match those reports eventually with the monies that got deposited into their bank. So if they were like, hey, Mariette, it looked like this week I grossed, you know, $15,000, but why do I only have $13,000 in my bank? So what we would do is we'd actually do a reconciliation between their point of sale system and their bank. And we would realize that maybe the point of sale system isn't taking into account that they're getting paid with credit cards and the credit card companies are reducing their funds by merchant fees. Do you see how important now it is to be able to see where those information is coming from so you can start doing reconciliations and you can start finding and troubleshooting those areas. So those are the kind of things you all wanna be thinking about and looking for. Um, of course, you could have a cash receipt book. Any contractors that actually work on the job all day long, they still use the receipt book. You know, they give me a receipt at the end of the job, and then they have to go back now and reconcile that into their electronic system. And you also may be writing this all down in some type of spreadsheet ledger as well. Now, what other money transactions should you be thinking about? Now, these are the ones that are more interesting because, you know, when people think about money in, the first thing they think about is, Income. So there are other types of money in transactions that come into our bank and, and have to be posted into our books, but they may not be revenue. And these are examples of them. For instance, when you uh, deposit your own money into the business, that's considered an owner's contribution. If you get a loan from a bank or you have lines of credit, those are actually considered liabilities, but of course they do inject cash into your business. Maybe you have some cash advances or grants, or maybe you bought something from a vendor and you didn't like it, and so they refunded you. That's not income. That's a refund from an expense that you paid out to a vendor. And so those are the type of transactions now you want to start thinking about because, again, our brain commonly goes to, oh, yeah, all deposits are income and all money out are expenses, but not necessarily. So now we're going to go ahead and cover tracking the money out. So this is what I want to cover as the lowdown of what expenses to be tracking. Now, again, when we talk about money out, there is the legitimate expenses or ordinary and necessary business expenses that are very common as a business owner. And then we'll also cover some additional not so ordinary business expenses. And then we'll also cover uh, money out that may not even be considered an expense. So let's start with the lowdown on what are common, ordinary, and necessary business expenses. On the Schedule C Part 2, the IRS essentially gives you your list of expenses. And so many times when I speak with a self-employed business owner, they go, well, what expenses can I deduct? And I always ask them, have you ever looked at your tax return? And so I always usually tell them, well, let's go ahead and do a little practice here, a little game. And I want you to go ahead and actually open up the Schedule C. It's super simple. Just go to Form 1040, Schedule C, Google it. And when you go to that Form 1040, Schedule C, look at all of the different expenses that are available to you. It's that simple. And then you can start thinking about your own business profile. Again, when I talk about business profile, what line of business are you in? What's common for your business? What's ordinary and necessary for your business? And then start thinking and writing those down. And that's a common practice that I do with my self-employed community. And so again, these uh, items here should look pretty similar um, to maybe things that you're already taking in your business. Ones that I just wanna highlight, um, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, there's no more entertainment that's able to be deductible. So you can, of course, use it as a business expense, but you won't be able to deduct it. Business expenses that are limited, for instance, meals. When you have a meal or when you take your client out for a meal or when you're traveling and need to eat on your travel and have a meal, those are 50% deductible. And so not only do you want to keep in mind that there are specific expenses related to your business, you also want to make sure that you know that there are some exceptions sometimes or limitations to those 
expenses. So again, the most common thing to do or the most, uh, the smartest way for you to just to get a jump start on this is go grab that Schedule C Part 2 and see what's available to you on that form. Now let's actually cover some not so ordinary business expenses. Now when I say not so ordinary business expenses, what I mean is that many times when business owners think about their expenses, they think about two things. First, they think rationally, okay, well, you know, I need this for my business, it's ordinary and necessary, so it should be an expense that I can deduct in my business. And then the next thing they may do is they may go ahead and grab that Schedule C and look what's on that Schedule C under expenses. What they may miss, though, is that there are some business expenses available to this business owner that, that they can also take as an expense on their business. That's why I like to call them not so ordinary because it's not that common expense you would think about and it possibly is also an expense that you will clearly see on your Schedule C. So here is a list of those expenses here. And just something to note here is that these expenses may require additional substantiation. They may require more complex calculations. And they're found in a different place on a tax return. Many times they are. Let's say you want to go ahead and take mileage. Well, that's going to be found in your mileage log or on your mileage app on your phone. And you're going to want to go ahead and export that into Excel and create a mileage log and then take that expense to create your tax ready books. What about the transactions that are related to um, you actually paying a business expense with your personal fund? What's important here is that if you legitimately paid a business expense with your personal funds, then you're essentially needing to create a petty cash log so you can explain, hey, I have these five receipts that equal $500 and I want to go ahead and expense that back onto my books. How do I do that? And so then you're going to go ahead and have to put, post that back into your book so you can have tax ready books, but you need to be keeping track of that because that is a not so ordinary expense. Now let's close this conversation with uh, the not so ordinary and many times not even expenses transactions, but they are still considered money out transactions. Number one, this is the most common one. What happens when I pull money out of my self-employed business? So when you pull money out of your business, that is not considered an expense. That's an owner draw out of your equity, out of your profit. And so yes, can it be money out? Absolutely. Is it money out? Yes, it is. But is it an expense? It is absolutely not an expense. Also, what about if you did get that loan, whether it was that private loan or whether it was that bank loan, what happens when you write those checks back to those loans? What part of that payment is an actual expense and what part of it is not? So you went ahead and you got a $20,000 loan. Now it's the next month and now you have to start amortizing that loan and paying it over, let's say, three years. You write that first check for that loan. Is that an expense? Are you just writing an expense for loan payments and putting that right on your profit or loss? The bank loan is considered a liability. So a liability basically means you went ahead and injected cash into your business and let's say it's that $20,000 and you need to pay that full $20,000 back. So when you start paying that check back, you're going to be paying that $20,000 back but the bank's not going to just lend you $20,000. They're going to lend you $20,000 and then charge you for the cost of capital. And that cost of capital is called interest. And so when you are writing that check for the principal and the interest for that bank loan, the principal is actually just a repayment of that loan, which is not an expense. But the cost of capital, so the interest you have to pay because you got a $20,000 loan, that is considered an expense. So see how tricky that can be? So the principal payments back for the $20,000 loan is not an expense, it's just money getting paid back to the bank. But because they're charging you interest on borrowing money, 
that interest is actually considered the expense. And so what do you need to do there? You need to split that transaction. Now let's use the example of the credit card payment. So you go ahead and you charge, let's say $5,000, it's your first month, you are a field service provider and you buy a bunch of materials at Home Depot. When you first charged that $5,000, that was when you actually received the expense for those supplies. You swiped your credit card and that credit card, those transactions possibly hit your credit card account. Now it's the end of the month and let's say you're very disciplined and you're gonna pay that full $5,000 payment back to the credit card. All you're doing is paying off the balance. You already got the expense for the credit card transactions when you first swiped that card. And so you can't call the credit card transactions when they hit your credit card and expense. And then a month later, when you pay off your credit card, that's not another expense. That's just paying off the credit card balance. You see how that can get tricky, especially when it comes to thinking about it. Some other type of money out transactions are monies transferred from bank to bank. That can get very, very tricky. We know that if you transfer money from your savings to your checking or your checking to your payroll or your payroll to your savings, we know that that's not an expense at all. That's just money going from one hand to another. And so we know for sure, is it a money out transaction? Absolutely. Is it an expense transaction? Absolutely not. Also returns to customers. So when your customer pays you and then you have to return the money back, that's not an expense, that's a return of the original payment. And then another money out transaction that's very common is that you may actually have a money transaction that you'll need to split between the business and the personal. Again, this is not a, something that we would ever uh, suggest as an accounting or bookkeeping professional. We discourage any type of commingling, but I am well aware that when you're a self-employed individual, if let's say you go to Costco and you had to buy you know, supplies for your business and then, oops, I decided to put some shampoo and conditioner into that checkout line. Well, of course, you're gonna go ahead and put the shampoo and the conditioner as a personal withdrawal, but the business supplies, if you went and bought folders and if you bought pens and other supplies, you can absolutely call that a business transaction. But what would you have to do in that case? You're gonna to have to split that transaction. The last thing I wanna cover when it comes to expenses and money out is also, let's go back and bring up that conversation about thinking about what you can deduct and how to be more strategic on your taxes. So there is nothing wrong with wanting to maximize your tax savings. So when people say I wanna save more taxes, that's an absolute legitimate strategy. We all should wanna save more taxes. We're not saying we don't wanna pay taxes and we're definitely not saying we wanna evade taxes, but we can think about our business from a perspective of what we do and how we manage our business and our finances and when we think about that, what are the best ways or best choices to make to maximize those tax strategies? So for instance, if I know that I can work out of my house and have an outside office, is there a way for me to be able to deduct both the outside office and the home office? Let's say for instance, I drive a lot for my business. I'm an independent contractor. I'm a field worker, a field service worker. Does it make sense for me to use my actual expenses for my car or does it make sense for me to use a standard mileage? Let's say that I am in a business where I have to drive a lot of my clients around. Does it make more sense for me to buy a business vehicle? And if it, I need to do that, should I buy the vehicle outright or should I lease the vehicle? Does it make sense for me to actually invest in learning? Of course, you're all here, right? So you're investing in education. Um, what other ways can you invest in your business? You can leverage technology. You can start building out your system. Does it make sense for me to go ahead and create a more robust customer management system or start implementing new apps like QuickBooks Online or other type of smart apps for your business? Well, does it make sense? Ask yourself the question, is it ordinary and necessary for me to build, grow, thrive, and succeed financially in my business? If it is, then it could very possibly be a legitimate expense, which means you should be able to deduct it, which means you're maximizing your tax savings. And this is really just a bonus slide for you to really think about um, different areas of your business and how you can maximize those tax savings 
with your deductible business expenses. So this is going to go in depth into the three financial statements that all small business owners need to take ownership of and truly equip themselves in regards to transforming data into dollars. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through each one of the financial statements slowly. And we're also going to now start pulling in a lot of the concepts we've already covered specifically in the area of chart of account. So what a complete balance sheet looks like. So remember I told you that balance sheet has assets, liabilities, and owner's equity. But what it truly provides is a snapshot of the business's financial condition on a specific day in time. And so when you're pulling up a balance sheet, you're actually pulling up a day in the life of the business. But what's most important is when you're looking at the balance sheet that you understand that assets, it's what you own, liabilities is what you owe to yourself or to usually vendors or lenders. And lastly, what's left over is your net worth or your equity. Now, this is what a balance sheet looks like in QuickBooks, or if you are building it out in an accounting software or even in Excel, this is essentially the way it'll eventually get built out. So essentially, a balance sheet starts from the top and you go down. I call it the top-down approach. Even when it comes to the idea on how you're reviewing your balance sheet, you always review the balance sheet from the top and then you go down. You also want to make sure that the balance sheet balances. That's why it's called the balance sheet. And so you want to double check that the total assets equal the total liabilities and equity. Now, the beauty of it is that if you're using an accounting software, it's essentially creating the balance sheet in the background as you're pulling transactions in. However, that doesn't mean that your balance sheet is balanced. So you still need to learn the accounting principles and the accounting tasks related to making sure that you can troubleshoot that everything looks good, that everything's balanced, and that your balance sheet balances. Most importantly is the idea, again, that it's a top-down approach. So when in doubt, start at the top and go down. One other really important concept around the balance sheet is that the balance sheet is actually built on liquidity. Now, what does that mean? So when you start taking that top-down approach, you realize that the most liquid items that can essentially be liquidated into cash or paid quickly with cash are gonna be on the top. So for instance, if I have a cash account, a bank account, that's obviously the most liquid. Then the next thing that will follow under my assets would be inventory, and then after that would be my fixed assets because that's gonna take longer for me to liquidate. That concept is the same under liabilities. My credit cards, hopefully I can pay those quickest and fastest along with my accounts payable, but my long-term loans and my credit lines, those are gonna take a little longer for me to pay them off, so those are gonna be lower on the list. So not only do you have to keep in mind that you have a balanced approach from top to bottom, but that it's built in a way that is aligned with your liquidity. Now let's cover the income statement, also referred to as the profit and loss. Now, what does a complete income statement or profit and loss look like? Now, what's really important is that even though we brought in several of these account names and account types through the chart of accounts, we're now gonna pull those accounts in to this particular form or statement called the income statement because we want to be able to report the business's profitability for a specific period of time. So now we don't have to choose a specific day. We can actually choose a specific range, month to month, quarter to quarter, or even year to year. And so that's why this becomes such an incredibly powerful statement for you and for you to serve your community. Now you wanna keep in mind that there are specific totals on this particular report. There's the gross revenue, which is also called the top line. The gross profit is really the top line total because you wanna make sure that you have enough in gross profit to pay the rest of your expenses. Then you have operating profit, total net profit before taxes, and then total profit after taxes. 
So what this really is, if you're speaking about this from a managerial perspective, you do need to learn the additional terminologies. When we're talking about gross revenue, cost of goods or cost of sales, all the way up to gross profit, we're talking about above the line items. The first top line is incredibly important, the gross profit, because if we don't have enough gross profit, we're not going to be able to pay the rest of our expenses and more importantly, accumulate wealth by leaving some of these earnings to accumulate over time. Then if you take your gross profit list, all of your other operational expenses, you have what's called EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. If you take those rest of those expenses, you finally get to the bottom line. And the bottom line is essentially what you have left over when it comes to net profit. And this is what it looks like in QuickBooks Online. So again, hopefully you're starting to pull together the idea that even though I'm showing it to you in Excel and you can really build it out, you're going to have to spend some quality time in the chart of account to be able to see the same thing here. Again, in the profit and loss, based on the way you pull in the chart of account types, you have your income, you have your expenses that are separated between cost of goods or administrative expenses, and then you have your other income, which is income and other expenses, which brings you down to your bottom line. And again, just like the balance sheet is based on liquidity, the profit and loss or income statement is based on the calculation of income minus expenses gets you to your bottom line. So let's get equipped with the cash flow statement. Which financial statement reports a company's cash flows, inflows, and outflows over an accounting period? The cash flow statement. And what is the most important financial insight that this statement gives us? Where did all my money go? So what's important before we get into the cash flow statement is to really understand that the cash flow statement is different from the income statement because cash flow in and cash flow out can be completely unrelated to the income statement or it could be related to the income statement. And so what we're doing is we're reconciling that. We're reconciling transactions that are cash flow in or cash flow out related, and we're putting it all on one statement called the cash flow statement. So the cash flow statement reports transaction based on how cash truly moves in and out of your business. And that's why it's called cash flow. It also separates transactions into three categories because as I mentioned, since it reconciles all of these transactions, it needs to separate them into three categories. And then we are able to see what type of changes in cash has happened based on those categories. And lastly, you're able to reconcile the cash back to the balance sheet. So let's break down the cash flow statement. So the cash flow statement, and we're only going to cover the indirect method, it basically starts with the net income. So you actually start with net income, and then you have to add or subtract the cash flow related to specific categories in your business. And the categories are basically split into three areas, the operations of your business, the investing in your business, and the financing in your business. And we're going to look at some examples of that in a moment. Now, when you start with your net income and you add or subtract back the cash flows or the changes in cash flow that relate to operations or investing or financing, what you ultimately get is your change in cash flow. And then what you get is if you take your net income plus or minus that change in cash flow, that truly is going to give you the cash on hand. Now, let me show that to you a little bit more visually. Here are some examples of what would be an operating activities. So I always like to say, ask yourself the question, what happened related to cash when my accounts receivable went up or down, when my inventory went up or down, when I went ahead and reported depreciation, but that truly isn't a cash transaction. So the question really is, what happened to cash when? You ask that same question when it relates to investing activities and also that same question when it relates to financing activities. 
And so again, cash flows from your operating activities plus cash flow from your investing activities plus cash flow from your financing activities will equal the new balance. Now, when we went deeper into this topic, I also went ahead and started sharing some deeper knowledge in regards to financial fundamentals, like the two financial statements, the profit and loss and the balance sheet, and I was sharing the accounts that you would find on those financials, income and expenses, and other type of expenses on the profit and loss, assets, liabilities, and equity on the balance sheet. Now, that was an area that you definitely will want to get more knowledge on. If you want to go deeper and really build those accounting fundamentals inside of you, whether it's for your own entrepreneurial financial knowledge, or more importantly, if you serve the small business community, then definitely connect with me because I have a course specially for you. Bye for now.